Welcome back to the World Extreme Medicine podcast. My name is Will Duffin, GP and Education Lead. This series is for all the medical mavericks out there. Those of you who refuse to just climb the career ladder, to blindly accept the script that's been written for you by management and want to forge your own path to make your mark. And in this series, we're talking to a range of both medical and non-medical guests who have all done just that. And we're going to learn how and why they've done it. My guest today is Sean Conway. Sean's an endurance endurance adventurer, author and motivational speaker originally from Zimbabwe. And he's had tons of great adventures. He was the first person to cycle, swim and run the length of Great Britain from Land's End to John O'Groats. He's completed the world's longest triathlon. That's a 4,200 mile journey around the coast of Britain, completely self-supported. Oh, and did I mention he's also cycled around the world? And for those of you that have Sean on video, you can see he has the beard to end all beards. Sean recently moved from North Wales uh, to North Wales from the lakes, where he lives with his wife, Caroline, and his 10 month old son, Montgomery. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. That's a glowing introduction. Can you write that bit for my website, please, actually? <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Yeah, yeah. How's the weather up in North Wales today? It's all right, actually. It's just started drizzling, which is actually a bit welcome. You know, the Welsh plants in our garden don't do so well when it hasn't rained for at least five minutes. So it's, it's quite nice now just to be a bit cooler. Yeah. And you've got a few little projects on the go at home, I gather. A lot of projects, yeah. I'm a. I definitely. I have to build or fix or make stuff like for my mental health. Um, so I've got everything. Just and it's quite great. It's good actually because I was meant to be away now uh, for six weeks, um, and I would have left. Or you know, a little. It's like that little bit of skirting in the corner behind behind the curtain. You never look at it, right? So you'd, eventually it'll be ten years before you eventually get around to it. Whereas now getting that opportunity which is quite nice it's nice to be home you know because I'm often away so yeah this is, yeah yeah it's great making the most of it great great now let's go right back to the beginning Sean because your, your career is quite unique in that you didn't really transition into being an endurance athlete uh, and an adventurer until around the age of 30 I'd like to talk a moment about what your life looked like before that let's go back to corporate Sean this is when you were working as a photographer in London tell me what your life looked like back then well I'm gonna go even further back to when I was a teenager you know photography was my life you know when I was 15 16 I just dreamt of being this like amazing travel photographer that was the dream the dream was to travel the world photographing all these amazing tribes being in the Atacama desert, you know, just, I just had this dream that that was going to be my life. And then, you know, and I think a lot of people, this happens to them in, in their twenties, you just sort of kind of get suckered into, to, to sort of, and I wouldn't say it. Like people often say, Oh, you know, I was just doing what society says I should do or what my, you know, what the world perceives as success and blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't society putting any pressure on me. My parents are amazing. You know, I said, I want to be a photographer, you know, that's kind of off the wall anyway. Um, and so it was just, it was all me. It wasn't me. Like, I didn't feel like there was this external pressure on how I should conform. And like, there was none of that, you know, and I think people wave that flag a lot, but I think you should really take ownership of your own decision sometimes and not go, Oh, well, I, would, I thought I should be doing this because of other people. But actually, it was all me. I basically just wanted to earn money. And that was it. It was a purely financial, all my decisions in my entire 20s were pretty much financially driven. Um, and that was just in my own, you know, I haven't really I should looked back deep enough to, to think why I just wanted to earn loads of money. That was it. I just was like, how as a photographer, can I earn as much money as possible thinking, well, if I earn more money, I'll be able to buy nice things. And and that again was just personal. You know, I wanted to buy, drive a nice car. I wanted to live in a nice house, and I wanted to have a big telly. I mean, I don't know why. I don't want the, don't want those things now. But you know, it's but I did back then, and and no one was pushing me to do them. Like none of my friends had nice cars, or so it's not even like I had peer pressure. Um, and 
and yeah and then so i did it i did the grind and i soon worked out that in the world of photography because you can do many things you can do travel photography journalism weddings funerals i got asked to do a few funerals in my career um but the one for me at the time that really paid the bills was school portrait photography and we all remember you sitting in front of pretty much the background we used to use sometimes <laughs> mottled gray that's the one <laughs> you know you, you, if you just turn to your side do this yeah. put your head at an angle yeah uh, <laughs> look at me and then you go yeah there we go <laughs> click done there we go that's 50 quid from the parents job done um, Sounds like a real money spinner it was you know and it, it just life became a numbers game i realized the more kids i photographed and as long as they weren't crying um i would <laughs> i would earn x amount of money and each it, kid it probably wasn't until they got home and looked at their photo <laughs> yeah. that the tears started yeah, probably yeah exactly it, ironically the <laughs> One of the biggest complaints we used to get, so people used to email through, so you you know, you upload the pictures online, they have a secure password and whatever. And um, it was hilarious because we used to be a bit creative with the contrast and the and the brightness and that because everyone wanted that, you know, it moved from mottled grey actually to a white background and it was all high key and overlit and bleached out faces and stuff because that was kind of the trend in the early 2000s. Um, uh, yeah, the biggest complaint we used to get was, uh, thank you for the photos. It's lovely, but I think you've made our kid ginger. <laughs> 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 I, oh, I felt like sending them a picture of me just going, I have <laughs> all the ginger. You'd be careful what you say. Um, but it was because we, you know, if you had Albany hair, when we did this sort of high contrast and, and, and that and the saturation yeah. level, it did make you look a little bit ginger to be there. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, business was good. Pe parents mm. buy pictures of their kids, you know, and each kid was, worth x amount of money to me and if the more i photograph the more more i earned um and i did that all the way until i was 30 but i gradually was sort of just getting more and more miserable um and it wasn't like a it was such a slow progress and i'm such a i'm such a like i'm so stubborn in my nature which has worked well for me now but back then it meant you know everyone says oh don't quit you know keep going like yeah, you know, sometimes you just need to know when to quit. And, you know, after a couple of years of just being a bit unhealthy, a bit lazy, just not having real motivation to get up every day and business was getting big, you know, for us in it as a photographer, you know, we had departments in the Midlands, uh, London and the Channel Islands. We had seven staff, we had an office and, you know, all these things, because that's the problem, right? You The, the more money you earn usually correlates to a more stressful life. For the most part, you know, some people get lucky and there's difference. Right? But generally, the higher up the sort of food chain you get when you start earning more and you get busier, like life gets stressful. Um, and that's what just was happening. You know, every day, all of a sudden I wasn't shooting anymore. That was another thing, which I inherently just loved. I loved setting up lights. I loved composition. I loved being creative. I loved the techie side and cameras and aperture you know just everything about photography i absolutely love different you know i was shooting back in the day i was shooting large format then medium format slide film you know hundreds of hours in the dark room you know um and all of a sudden i was now just answering complaint emails about ginger kids not being ginger um you know and yeah and must have just thought fuck my life yeah and it was just like i knew everything like i knew how mm. i knew the eight most um lucrative poses to do for kids you know so we we do eight different poses because th these were mainly nursery <laughs> schools we were shooting so wow, you know we yeah. would do do babies up to sort of five years old so i knew the jumping one was amazing i knew the hands in front of the camera one was cool you know and you just you're sitting there and you just pack shot like jump boom 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 you got puppet in the sand a camera in the sand <laughs> and i remember there was one time i sort of you know this kid kind of ran like um uh, crawled past me to get to the, the thing and you know what little did i know you left a trail of poo <laughs> as he went onto the background and i lay in it and i'm lying there with a puppet in this hand a camera in this hand going here's a silly sausage with my elbow and feces going <laughs> this this is so far from photographing some tribes in the peruvian jungle <laughs> you so, know, yeah, I mean, big departure from your original dream of being yeah. uh, this travel photographer yeah exactly so um mm. Yeah, I basically just turned 30 and, you know, like 30 is so old when you're young, right? And I just remember thinking, why am I not traveling the world? Um, so I, I literally went into my business one day, told my business partner, James. So there's two of us, me and James. Um, I went out, 
just like oh well, I just was like the switch in my head was just like <clears throat> like I just don't want to pick up a camera ever again for the rest of it, like ever. Um, and I, he's like, "Are you sure?" I was like, "I just I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I had no plans." I said, I, "All I know is this can't carry on." Um, so I said, "Can you just legally buy my shares?" So I had to physically legally step out as being a director. Um, so he bought my shares and he offered me a pound and I was like, sweet, I'll take it, you know, let's go. <laughs> like I, I went out. Um, and that was it, you know, 30 years old. I, I have, I, I don't have any A-levels and I didn't go to university. Um, you know, photography was just a hobby that I got good at. Um, so then was like, wow, now what, <laughs> you know, so that was sort of where I, where I stood. And then. So at I that got... point when you left your photography business you actually had didn't have a clear idea of where you wanted to go next you just knew you wanted to do something different so the only thing i kind of thought was let me go traveling like so that was in the back of my head i was like and in in that sort of dep- i don't want to say the word depression because that is a very serious sort of illness but in in that sort of i mean i probably was depressed but it wasn't like depression like i think there's a difference you can be depressed without having depression, I think. I don't know, I'm not a doctor, I'm sure someone will correct me, but you know, you can feel miserable, but I think when you're miserable for so long, you know, it's just something needs to change, right? So um, I certainly didn't feel like I had depression. I just felt like I was just in a rut. Basically, I was in a rut. And I thought, well, if I go traveling, I'll get out the rut. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll just, I'll leave my business. I'll sell everything. I'll, you know, I was renting a nice flat. I'll get rid of my car and I'll just go traveling. Um, so I sold the business and I had this one pound note and then all of a sudden the reality of like, well, actually I, I kind of, if I sold the car, I'd have to move out the flat immediately because the car would only cover a few months rent, <laughs> you know? And then all of a sudden, well, once I'd done the maths, like even if I just sort of on day one, just quit, but you know, you've got to give your landlord a month's notice. And blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden the reality hit in that actually I've, I've got no money. I had, I had maybe, 500 pounds in the bank like genuinely i had nothing um and i was like oh this whole like going traveling thing is possibly a lot more difficult than i thought without any cash like i had no capital um because you know what it's like in london you know you the more you earn the more you spend and you know that's basically how i had no savings um so i had a credit card i think i had 1500 pounds on a credit card so I was kind of like, well, I can use that for a bit of rent. And then like, that's my travel fund gone, really. Um, so I was like, well, I'm not, I don't have enough money to go traveling. And that was kind of like, oh, I have messed this up. <laughs> like I have, I have jumped the gun. You know, I should have maybe taken a year to save some money, keep doing the photography, maybe, you know, all these sort of things were going in my head. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, what am I going to do? And then I thought, should I carry on doing the photography on my own? Um, and then I sort of was like, oh, firstly, I don't want to, <laughs> cause I was just sick of it. Secondly, I don't have any kit cause all the kit went with the sale to James. And thirdly, James is like my brother, you know, like I didn't want to ruin that relationship and that friendship I'd built up over 15 years because we were still tight. Um, and he was super supportive. He was like, you sure, you know, that's cool. You know, but you know, I know you want out, but you know, I can't do this on my own. So that was the deal. Like you, I'll give you a pound and you can go off and do your travels. Um, but I'll, I need everything to run this business on my own. Right. Um, and I didn't want to ruin that friendship, you know, by going, Oh, thanks. By the way, I'm going to go and set up on my own. Um, so I was, I was like, right. So what, what am I going to do? I had to like think outside the boxes. Like, right. What, what could I do? Right. Okay. Well, I could maybe, you know, just try and, you know, I could ask my family for money, but I didn't, well, firstly, they didn't probably have any for me. Um, maybe I could do some writing, you know, maybe I could, you know, get some magazines to sort of maybe pay for me to write articles, but then I hadn't written anything. So I was like, well, I got no portfolio. <laughs> um, and then the only thing I sort of thought back to was I had actually cycled Land's End to John O'Groats a couple of years before this, 2008. I was woefully slow. So it took me 25 days to cycle Land's End John Groats. The record now is 41 hours. <laughs> 42, it was 44 hours back then. So under two days, it took me 25 days. I was terrible 
terrible cyclist. Um, however, at the end, I just felt this amazing kind of buzz and this this weight off my shoulders. You know, it was and it was a, a mixture of being fitter, eating healthier, spending more time outside, which I think are three key elements for well-being: eating healthier, getting fitter, and spending more time outside in natural light. Um, and and I had a goal and a purpose and it was tough and it was miserable and I was traveling. I know it was Britain, but it was travel and cheap travel. Like the cycling is, you know, by far the cheapest, most efficient way you can travel somewhere. You can cover great distances and you can do it on, you know, very little money. Um, so I kind of thought, well, what if I do some sort of cycling based adventure? But that still involves money. So what if I try and break some sort of record? that is cycling based um maybe i'll get a sponsor like because i'd seen people row the ocean row oceans the atlantic and climb everest and go to the south pole they will sort of have land rover and microsoft you know all these big companies you know it's, it seemed like a thing like oh, well people must have silly ideas and get funding like that must be a thing and it is it's been a thing in britain for 200 years even if you read shackleton's book uh, about his journey and you know he had hundreds of hundreds of different sponsors that's 200 years ago um uh 100 years ago <laughs> sorry not 200 i'll be called up on that um but you know so centuries ago people were doing this so i thought well, okay well it must be a thing so i at the time i then found out about this round the world bike race um uh which a guy called vin cox who used to have the record for the circumnavigation he thought when he finished he broke the record he thought you know what my record can be easily broken why does the next few people who want to break it, why don't you all start on the same day and make it a race? Because that'd be kind of fun. Um, and I thought that'd be cool. If Maybe if it's an official race, that'll again attract, the, it'd be more likely for someone to fund the idea rather than little old Sean who takes 25 days to cycle 900 miles. Um, so you didn't you put know. that on your resume when you were approaching potential <laughs> well, sponsors? I told them I'd cycled the leg that Britain, I didn't tell them how quick it took me, <laughs> how slow it took me even. Um, and, um, you know, and that was it. So that was like, once the idea was in my head, I was like, right, that's it. So I entered the race and I just, you know, just went out to try and do the sponsorship grind back then, you know, and that was just asking friends of friends of friends of friends, like, does anyone? And eventually through my mate, Matt, his boss, uh, was big into cycling, big into raising money for the same charity that I was going to raise money for. And it all just kind of come to, came together. And I managed to mm. get the funding, which was basically just to buy a bike, flights around the world, insurance and food, basically, and a couple of hotels in in some of the sort of uh, more dangerous countries, as it were. Yeah. Um, and, and that was it. You're so, good yeah. to go. Yeah, 2012 started in Greenwich um 18th of february just before the olympics with the idea of getting back to london for the olympics um and yeah, i understand uh, about four thousand miles into this you ran into a spot of spot of bother yeah so that was going well so i mean the, the record at the time yet i had to do about 160 miles a day um mm. which is tough it is tough but it's not impossible like it is achievable you can have a couple of bad days and still claw them back in in an eighteen thousand mile yeah. ride um and yeah i was doing really well i went down through spain morocco into um south america from santiago uh up to lima um and then a little bit in ecuador because you have to pass two opposite ends of the earth and because there's so much water in the southern hemisphere there's only two options really madrid and wellington and a place in ecuador and uh, malaysia and those are the two i went for um yeah. which are the the two the, the least popular ones. In fact, I think in every circumnavigation world record attempt, I'm the only one who's gone for those ones because no one goes to Africa or South America for a circumnavigation attempt. Yeah. Um, for good reason. It's slow. It's hot. It's the roads mm -hmm. are terrible. Um, but I wanted to do a little bit of every continent. I think, you know, if you're going to cycle around the world under the current rules, which is just the fastest 18,000 miles, which really allows for a lot of bending of those rules for, you know, you can just, fly you can get to a place and fly to another place um as long as you do the mileage so i didn't want to bend them too much so yeah i did a bit of every planet but yeah so i got to america four thousand miles in and unfortunately some gentleman 
um, on a, a speeding on his phone, just didn't see me and just wiped me out and uh, from behind. Um, I don't actually remember anything, so it's it's kind of cool because I uh, I don't have the trauma in my head, and I'm sure someone will be able to tell me. A bit, I guess it's a built-in thing that your brain sort of purposefully kind of erases some bad memories um, with a head trauma. Um, and and it's great. So I went to bed the night before and I woke up in hospital the, the following day. So I'd got up that morning. I'd cycled. I can't remember a couple of hours. I think it was still dark. Uh, I have vague recollections now, sort of that where at the time I sort of remember being on the side of the road. I didn't feel any pain, just the red and blue lights and a nurse over me going, sorry, sir, you've been in an accident. And I was obviously I said, oh, how's the bike? And I remember, actually, I do remember this. They said, oh, I'm sorry, sir. The bike's pretty totaled, man. And I was like, what? Just lie to yeah. me. <laughs> Tell yeah. me the bike's okay. And then if I die, <laughs> at least I'll die happy. <laughs> um, I remember being really annoyed with him, actually. In my head, I was like, I can't believe you just told me the truth. You know, because yeah. the bikes without so Guinness, basically, the Guinness say you have to do it on the same bike. And without a bike, the yeah, record yeah. is over. So in my head, that was super important. Well, when you spent 4,000 miles in the saddle, you two will have yeah. bonded. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but that's... Uh, that's quite an in- intense place to be. You know, you've thrown in your photography business. You, 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 you're striking out on your own. Um, you've just spent years, well, how long it took to plan this this epic world record attempt cycling around the world. And then here you are waking up in a hospital bed and it, mm. all, the whole thing is on the rocks. Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. The only thing that kind of happened is is in my head, I I... I sort of tricked myself into believing the record was still on, even though I, I kind of knew it wasn't, but I had to just lie to myself. I had to just be like, no, it's cool. I'm going to recover. Guinness actually had this other rule that which said, if you, if you reach an impassable barrier, uh, you're allowed to stop for two weeks maximum, no more than two weeks and then carry on. And an impassable barrier is normally the edge of a continent or a war zone and you have to fly over it or whatever. Anyway, I phoned them and I sort of said, you know, is is being run over considered impossible barrier? Do I get the two weeks? And they actually replied and said, yes, actually, on this occasion, we consider that a, an impossible barrier. So I was like, okay, cool. Uh, they immediately then, not immediately, but a few months later, they changed the rule that you can't do that and you actually can't stop the clock at all, which is a much better rule. This is much the rule before and when I did it was a silly rule because people were just taking two week breaks between continents and fully recovering. It was silly. Um, and yeah, so, but then but as soon as I sort of got on the bike, it was just like my mileage was way down. In America, I was doing 200 miles a day and I could barely do 150. Um, and at the time, I also was sort of while I was preparing to carry on, I had this little mini Olympic torch that some kids in Greenwich made me to take around the world for London. You know, take this mini torch around the world. It was amazing. It was 3D printed, a little light bulb with a button. It was beautiful. And um, and I just sort of thought, oh, man, these kids are going to be gutted if I don't take their torch around the world. So that kind of became my new motivation. You know, the record was was off even though in my head i still wanted to push it i still had to push it to get back to london in time for the olympics so um yeah you know people always say oh how did you kind of carry on you know carrying on was in the pain i had a neck brace at the beginning which didn't didn't really work because i had a t11 compression fracture um the neck brace didn't really work it's still pivoting and that would hurt um and i just you know i kind of just wanted to carry on, even though the carrying on at going home was actually putting me in a far worse position in life than mm-hmm. carrying on injured. So, you know, I just carried on. Um, I mean, did uh, you have, uh, did, was there any fear of being knocked off again while you were <laughs> cycling? Well, after that's the, that? Yeah. That's the other thing I had to kind of convince my parents, obviously that I was going to carry on. And the only way I could justify it in my head was that, no one gets run over twice. So I've, surely I've had my time. Like I've, like I've, I've been run over. So like I've, I've got it out of the way because what are the chances of 
getting run over twice like, it must be like zero <laughs> but, but, but in my head i was like well that, that's kind of it right because you never hear of anyone yeah. getting run over twice like everyone all these big bad accidents like james mm. cracknell and everyone you're like well yeah. they, you know no one gets it again so like i'm sweet like cool i survived the first time i mean what are the chances of getting run over again um, glad i got that out of the way yeah, no, I, got out of the yeah. way, I can carry on I'm, <laughs> So yeah, but um, no, I just become I'm super in, in, intuitive now on the road when I when I ride. I ride with one headphone, so I can always hear. And it's amazing how when you start analyzing um, the sound of vehicles coming up behind you, I know straight away whether whether a vehicle has seen me or not. It'll be the slightest change in accelerator. You know, someone will just take their foot off the brake a little bit, uh, take their foot of the accelerator a little bit. And it'll just be that slight tone, which means, oh, okay, I know they're coming. I always cycle with with uh, rear view mirrors on my handlebars and I have yeah. eight, eight tail lights normally, you know, mm-hmm. two on the helmet and they're just everywhere. High-vis jackets, reflective, oh, yeah. reflective tape up, up and down all my... Um, my yeah. chain stays and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, you need to be lit up like a Christmas tree for drivers to do. see, don't you? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's a really scary poll put out uh, a couple of years ago. Now they said uh, they asked loads of cyclists, "What's the most important out of you know out of two things? What's more important when you go cycling to be fashionable or visible?" And it was something like sixty percent or more, seventy percent said, "I'd rather be fashionable." invisible which is terrible because the fashion now are these sort of black sh- you know black shirts and these real dark colors and i'm like uh you know okay. yeah yeah it's re- so i cycle around bristol it's my main mode of transport yeah and uh it, last year i i was first on scene at three roadside traumas where cyclists had come off their bikes mm. Uh, it's really, really dangerous. Actually, ironically, none of those involve cars. That was all just <laughs> cyclists yeah. kind of yeah. losing control and riding into stuff. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's sketchy, isn't it? Yeah, and, totally. And, and that's just in that's in the UK. You now we've got a very uh, structured road system and, and a, yeah. a high level of road safety. I can't imagine yeah. you know, the, the additional risk that you're taking on when you're doing a circumnavigation and you're going through parts of Africa and South America where yeah. road safety is just not a thing. No, you're very much a second, third, fourth, fifth class citizen when you're on a bicycle, <laughs> you know. Um, the only thing that is interesting, so when I cycled across India, it was just, I mean, you know, again, the hierarchy is sort of truck, car, tuk-tuk, motorbike, scooter, bicycle. You're only one up from a pedestrian, really. Um, I think even a cow on a road is, actually a cow is at the top of the food chain, right? So a, a cyclist is just nothing. However, there in India was amazing because firstly they're so used to the chaos they're super spatially aware you know they know that they're three centimeters from you so but they're like what man that's three centimeters from you like until I until the tassels on my wing mirror hit your elbow you know um uh, and also in India if you're ahead you have right of way generally so if you're in town if you're ahead you can just turn left and everyone will wait like you can cross five lanes of traffic because you were ahead you know um and yeah so i mean it was nerve-wracking but once you sort of got your head around it it was it was okay well that's i mean that's in- incredible you had that huge setback and sure you lost the record but you you picked yourself up and you carried on you completed the challenge you you you, you cycled around the world i mean that's that's phenomenal <laughs> well yeah i mean that's another reason i carried carry on you know you don't often get two opportunities unless you're Mark Beaumont and Nick Sanders back in the day uh, to cycle <laughs> around the world twice. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thought I made the most of it, you know? But one thing I've, um, I found quite remarkable about your career in adventure so far, Sean, is that you haven't just restricted yourself to one discipline, to just the cycling, um, but you are very much a generalist. So you've also really pushed the limits with swimming and running. And this led to this, uh, crazy feat where you've ran, cycled, and swum the length of Great Britain. Tell us a bit about that. So I'd cycled it already, and when I'd finished cycling around the world, I, I sort of had this, and even before that, in this sort of like thinking outside the box, I thought, well, I can't, I don't, I don't want to just go traveling. Like let me, and I want, I need, well, I need to break a record. So let me think of just something daft. So I came up with this concept of trying to get the three F's of endurance a world's first, a world's furthest, and a world's fastest. And after I'd finished the cycle, again, I was sort of, I'd lost the motivation for cycling a little bit. 
and I thought, well, let me, I want to try a different sport. I, I like the challenge of something new. Um, and swimming just came up. I, I, my friend Dave Cornfrey was swimming down the Missouri, so I blame him mainly uh, for, for getting me into swimming. And I'd love Land's End John O'Groats. I think it's such a historic route. You know, it goes back centuries and it's, it's this, we live in the best island in the world and I wanted to explore it and I wanted to explore the ocean side of it. So I thought, why don't I swim Land's End John O'Groats thinking it had been done. I thought, let me become the fastest person to do it. So I was like, right, okay. And I went online and said, oh, okay, who's the fastest? Anyway, this chap, I'll call him Tim. I can't remember his name now, but Tim swims Land's End to John O'Groats in seven days i was like what <laughs> mad. the, the yeah. running the running records nine days like how can yeah. you swim it faster and i was like this is impossible yeah. anyway tim's got gills right yeah exactly well it turns out this this guy tim he put a swimming pool on the back of a van and did lengths as they drove it <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. He's done yeah, it. He's done it. Hats you know? off to them. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Technically, it, yeah. They, they, it's true. Yeah. He's nailed it. So, um, <laughs> so all of a sudden, it, it turned out that no one had even attempted that swim. So, I, yeah. So, 2013, I sort of had a crack at it after months and months of just kind of not any, no one wanted to back it financially to, you know, pay for crew and, and food and that. Eventually, Speedo came on board, like, but only like four days into the swim, you know. <laughs> I think I'd start there. We're like, wow, are you serious? Right. Okay. Let's go. Oh, it's actually <laughs> <doing> it. <laughs> um, so that was a tough one to pull off the ground because it's just, everyone said that, especially back then, 2013, like no one had done anything similar. Um, you know, nowadays, you know, for the most part, I think, you know, getting big projects off the ground is a little bit easier now, I think, because people kind of know what's possible. Like with humans, we're pushing ourselves more and more and more. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that's, wow, he can do that, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Let's go for it. Um, and yeah, so yeah, that's, that is when I finished the swim. And then after the swim, of course, you know, I'd done the cycle and the swim. So of course I had to do the run, which actually took me two attempts to finish. The first attempt I got injured taking a selfie while running, um, which the Sun newspaper took great pleasure in printing a half page on, on me falling over because of a selfie. Um, and um, yeah, all that credibility from the man who swam Britain. I'm now like the selfie guy. You know? um, but um, yeah, so that's kind of how I did, but it was never, it was, it was never intentional as a triathlon. It just kind of evolved and I just kept pushing the idea and pushing this concept of just trying to yeah. kind of get better. But, you know, this is your main income stream and, um, you know, social media is, is how we, we uh, connect with um, with people and, and also how ultimately you can generate an, an income from from the work that you do. I mean, do you find that you know, all of the social media that you have to do, all the pictures that you have to gather, all the Instagram posts that you have to push out, do you find that it interferes with being able to experience the the journeys that you've been on the landscapes the people is that is that quite onerous or is it something that that's nat that comes naturally to you so it's interesting i i'm the way i've set things up is i don't rely on social media uh at i, I rely on a little bit but it's not a game changer in in me being able to do what i do um for a lot of people it is and, and I get it, you know, the more followers you have, you leverage that against an audience. So brands will happily get involved. Um, I've never set myself up under that sort of model, as in the influencer model and that sort of thing. Um, I do it the other way around. So I've, I've built up this, this catalog of, of endurance records. And what I use is then I get, I work with brands to create cool content with them rather than me just plugging stuff on my social media channels. Cause I think that can be very phony. It can be very fake. It's, I don't enjoy it. I don't believe they get much from it. So I don't think anyone wins. I think it used to be interesting. I think, you know, three or four years ago, I think that was a great way of doing it. Um, I think the, the people watching now are pretty clued on, you know, they're pretty clued into what's going on. So I, I, I rather like any sportsman, I, I just try and become a, an ambassador for a brand rather than just doing like little one-off things here. And, and what we do is we just go out and we create amazing stuff together. You know, we will go and do little mini adventures. We'll create some fun videos. And that actually is super exciting for me. You know, I'm not just 
doing a post on something. I'm actually creating some cool stories. And then when I'm doing the challenge, it it actually the sort of it you know it incentivizes me to document it more. To be fair, you know, because when I cycled around the when I did Lands in Jungle, it was I had to find internet cafes to put a post up Facebook to tell my family I was okay. <laughs> you know, um, when I cycled around the world barely did any social media and even though i had sponsors and i was trying to break a record you know it, it kind of that's 2012 the climate is a bit different in the social media kind of things um and even now it's not a sort of a you have to tweet x on this day and right it's none of that like I, I don't agree to those sort of things i'd rather do stuff naturally and make it fun um, and at the moment i just want a, a good documentary as in of the of the event you know as in i want to document my challenges because all my grandparents all four of them died really before i had i got a chance to have really meaningful conversations with them because i was just too young and they all led these amazing lives you know and i just kind of wish they had had a folder of photos or instagram yeah. for grand grandparents imagine yeah. scrolling back like a hundred years on your granny's instagram like wow how cool that would be, pretty, right? Because you yeah. know that generation is way more hardcore yeah. than any of us will ever be. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. the sort of motivation now. The motivation isn't the sort of the sort of sponsorship side of it. The motivation to yeah. document things is purely for my son, so that my son yeah. can one day go, "Wow, Dad, you're so cool." Although I've been reliably <laughs> informed that kids never think yeah. their parents are cool, so <laughs> he'll be yeah. bigging you up in the playground, living, yeah, in, yeah, living in La La Land, <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another thing sean is that i'm you know, looking at your roots i mean you you have a, a track record of not taking the most direct route which is the most tempting thing to do if you're if you just want to get the record but for your run for example from lands end to john O'Groats, uh you actually took the the green routes you took the traffic free routes you wanted to experience a little bit of 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 great britain can you tell me a bit about that well so yeah two things so one is so I'd, I'd I'd cycled Lands End and Roads, which is on the road. So I'd explored a lot of the roads. I'd swum it, so I'd explored the coastline. Um, I I wanted to run it. I also have the sailing record randomly as well with two of my friends, <laughs> um, and so again was up the coast. So I I wanted to run it and explore the trails because there's so many amazing trails, and actually you can connect a lot of them uh, between trails. You can almost, well, you can. I think someone has done an entire Land's End Shona Groats off-road. Um, but, you know, so starting in Scotland, you've, you've well, the, the sort of the north bit down to Inverness. You're on the roads, but there's a couple of trails here and there, but it's pretty quiet. And then you've sort of got the Great Glen Way all the way down to Fort William. Then you're on the West Highland Way into Glasgow. And then you've got the old Glasgow Road, which is on the road, but it's pretty quiet. It follows all the way down to Carlisle. Then you're running through the Lake District, which is pretty phenomenal. Then pretty much from the Lake District, you can hit the canals and it's a little bit longer, but you can wind on the canals and that'll take you pretty much all the way nearly to Birmingham, pretty much on, on different canals. Yeah, there's a, of course, there's a few roads and things along the way. And then from Birmingham to Worcester Canal, then from Worcester, you're on the, the Seven Way, you know, and then eventually you're on the Southwest Coast Path. You know, that's not the entire route I took. I did cut through Somerset a little bit on the roads um, I wanted to go to to uh, Glastonbury <laughs> just to be on the tour because why not? Um, and yeah, so I did that, and that just allowed me to explore a little bit more. And actually, trail running in the long term is easier than road running because you, you, different different muscles. Um, wearing a rucksack's a bit difficult, so they say you should only carry about ten percent of your body weight on your back to avoid injury so i i was pushing that i was within a few weeks i'm at 65 kg so i'm pretty light pretty small so you know trying to get a pack down to six six seven kgs was pretty tough especially on those bits in scotland um because that just just changes your technique so your my my arches cave in my knees cave in my my abductors get tight um and and that sort of thing so uh, and then also fast and light you have this weird style where you sort of land up running backwards because you got the weight of your back yeah which yeah, didn't help good on, for you didn't help on my spine so eventually i had like down my right hand side i had this real tight nerve which i thought was hamstring it took years to 
diagnosed, but eventually someone up in the Lake District was like, "Now nah, that's that's your nerve." So I did some nerve flossing for a couple of months, and it's been fine ever since. So, um, but yeah, no, the trails. Are, I mean, you just get an OS map and you see how many trails yeah. Britain has. It's it's amazing, you know. It is. I, I, I'm. I just think we're so mm-hmm. lucky on this island to have the network of public footpaths, public access that's that great. we have. And um, I don't know about you, but I've got uh, OS maps on my phone. So wherever yeah. I end up in the UK and I'm traveling around, I the first thing I do is I load it up and I get the OS map out and I, I look for the little green dotted lines and I can plot really? a, li- a little yeah. run or a route just to explore something new. And it's it's just endless. You can spend a lifetime just on those dotted green lines around the and, UK. Uh, when I lived in the Lake District, and of course the lakes has probably slightly more trails than most places, but within, yeah. within a three mile radius of my house, there was 30 miles of trails. Yeah. 30 miles yeah, when I added the water, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, you can do 30 miles within three miles of your house in the lakes. I actually need to do it now in North Wales. Is um, so Of course, there's not as many here because we lived right in the middle of the lakes. Um, but I, I, I reckon there's still at least 10 or 15 miles of trails just wow. around my house, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's great, isn't it? And even in cities, so in, in Bristol, I've been discovering during lockdown, discovering all of the little green routes that are hidden away in the city, mm-hmm. this kind of the interface between the urban and um and forested uh, areas so where there's ever there's a river there's usually a, a green corridor running into cities yeah. and you can run for for miles along these these green corridors without even thinking you're in a city there's in there's heaven. so much to explore and i think for me certainly lockdown has been a great opportunity to uh to do that yeah definitely i think yeah everyone is all of a sudden found. it's it's great actually because there was all these little hidden trails that you know my wife and i would go on never see a single person and now it's like the m25 oh yeah yeah <laughs> it's great, doing you it. know people's <laughs> yeah. people are probably finding trails near their house that they didn't know existed mm. so that can only mm. be a good thing you know yeah absolutely so tell me about the swim sean because that's pretty gnarly so i, I I'm, I'm looking at your route i've got it on the screen in front of me and uh, you know, you're going around the top of Scotland, you're around the, the Hebrides, down past Northern Ireland. At one point, you cross from Ireland across to Wales. It, I, it's I, epic. I, I swam up, so I started down in, in Cornwall. So, um, Oh, so you went the other yeah, way. Okay, so I, there's yeah, no arrows I, on this. Yeah, so the, yeah. which part of that, that epic journey was the most challenging, do you think? It was all challenging in different ways and different times because of conditions and just boredom and weather and so you know getting to the start line was phenomenally difficult you know you know no one just no one believed it was possible so literally i was getting people like back nowadays i think people would just kind of go uh, and actually even nowadays generally i think people are pretty supportive of, of ideas now i think and i used to i i was i'll sort of put my hand up and say i was one of these people who would focus on the one bad tweet um and then fly the flag by, by going oh well you know i got negative feedback about this thing but come on like i think most people if you yes you're going to get one or two people who say it's rubbish and i think it's, it's it's a good story right it's a good story to focus on the two people who've said your idea is crap and you'll never do it even though there's 500 who said amazing i'll help you it's quite easy for people like me to go oh but look this person said i couldn't do it like come on like 500 people said you could do it don't focus on the two but you do because it's a cool story so anyway um but back then really it wasn't just tweets people were like writing me long emails you know and telling me all the different reasons why i was wasting my time i was putting posts up on yachting forums to just get a, an idea of, of what boat i should use you know what support boat should i should have a a motorboat should have a yacht you know how big should the yacht be where should the toilet be if it's in the front v it means you can't go to the toilet when two people are sleeping like all these sort of things i was asking questions you know and literally i put a thing up asking about logistics and all the replies were had nothing to do with giving me advice all just like you can't do this it's it'd be impossible to sail it in a small boat in a season and blah 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 blah, blah, blah. Um, eventually and, and it's weird because i had the sailing record now this was after the swim um, the sailing crowd are amazing. Like they're so upbeat and they're so generous, but for whatever reason on this forum, they just did not like the idea. Um, and even eventually at the end, one guy felt sorry for me. I'm really sorry, mate. Like normally we're, we're really positive people, but <laughs> you're really getting slated here. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I didn't, so I had no money to even get to Land's End. I had an email from Speedo 
which they sort of said a couple of weeks before the start, like, yeah, I think we're in. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, well, we're in, but let's just sort out the finances and we can sort you out. Uh, but that kind of didn't happen, as I said, until a few days in. Um, so I had to go, <laughs> it was hilarious. So I went to the bank, I had this email, which said, dear Sean, I think we're in, we can fund, you know, some money. Um, so I said, I said, listen, guys, like, I'm starting this in like a couple of days. I don't have enough money to get to Land's End. Please, please, please. Look, I've got the email. I'm going to get some money in. Please, can I borrow 250 pounds and as an extension on my overdraft so I can fill the car up with fuel, drive it to Land's End, and my mum can drive it back. And uh, this took two hours. Honestly, it took two hours. They sat, they phoned head office, and they're like, okay, well, I've seen the email, so we'll give you an extension by a couple of weeks for another 250 pounds. <laughs> and then... Um, and then, you know, when you get the funding, then you could, you, you pay it off and the, the overdraft will get cancelled. I was like, yeah, but that's cool. Anyway, so I did it and eventually Speedo was, you know, came on board and they were amazing. Um, so that was the, the one tough bit. The next tough bit was that first week because I had done no, no sea swimming at all. All I'd swum in was a, uh, a pool in Cheltenham because Cheltenham was too far from an ocean to, I couldn't afford to drive down to Somerset or whatever to get proper sea swimming. So that first week was terrible. We're all seasick. You know, I was throwing up in the water. The crew were throwing up everywhere, except Jez, the skipper. He always reminds me that he wasn't, but he looked a bit green. Um, so it was, it was chaos. I mean, no one came to the start media wise, you know, I was trying to raise money for war child, but no one came to the start. They were like, what's the point? You know, not even the, <laughs> the like, the, I always joke, the Land's End Gazette or Journal or whatever it is. And yeah, I think the guy lives down there. I mean, he could have, it would have taken him five minutes. He didn't even turn up. But then as soon as everyone found out that the whole crew was seasick, everyone was there. The one show points West. It was great. Um, and yeah, we raised loads of money for charity. So it was, it was all worthwhile. So yeah, so the first week was tough. And then I was sort of just getting to the swing of things. And then I had the Bristol Channel to, to cross. So that was Lundy to, uh, sorry, Heartland to Wales via Lundy Island. You yeah, know, that was a tough crossing, but the conditions were good. And then in Wales, I was going to go up Wales. And then we just had this kind of crazy idea to swim to Ireland because it looked kind of just as close as Wales to the Isle of Man, which it is. It's only a nautical mile further. And I was going to have to do Isle of Man, Isle of Man, Scotland, Scotland, Aaron around Mull of Kintyre. So I was going to have to do three crossings. So actually, if I got the island one out of the way, and also two of my crew members who, one was 28, the other was 35, have never been to Ireland. I was like, come on, like, that's unacceptable. <laughs> you know, we're going to <laughs> Ireland. Do something so, about that right now. <laughs> yeah, next day we, we turned left and we were like, all right, okay. And then we had these shipping lanes to cross and it was just... Yeah. 20 miles of shipping lanes, swimming directly across them at one mile an hour, you know. So it took a couple of days to get across the shipping lane, staying on shift at night when the tide was pushing me away from, from John O'Groats, but sort of sit out the tide and then try and motor back to the exact same point. So that's the way it went. Every time that the, the sort of I slept, a GPS pinpoint it, sleep somewhere. And at that time, we're just sort of floating around in the middle. Um, normally, we'd go to Anchorage and then come back. Um and that's actually when I, that's when I kind of knew the beard was becoming a thing because it actually physically stopped the tentacles touching my skin. So from that day on, sort of when it was sort of a little beard like yours, I thought of thought, right, that's it. Now I'm, I'm going full beard, going full beard. Yeah. Uh, were, stop, were, they, stop were the, the jellyfish, jellyfish a big issue then at, at, the, at the beginning of that? Yeah, especially at night. So because in the daytime, although my technique was terrible, I wasn't looking forward because that would hurt my neck. So, and I had this terrible style just to save, to stop me from chafing. So I'd sort of roll my whole body rather than turning my neck. And it was inefficient, but it, it was it kind of allowed me to carry on for longer. Um, so I, could, I was kind of could look forward a little bit every now and then to see if the viz was good to see the jellyfish. And then I would sort of just push them out the way. But usually by the time you've got to the jellyfish bit, the tentacles, you've swum through a meter of tentacles already. So a kind of yeah but then at night you just can't see anything so it's just boom in the face like <laughs> sucks yeah. onto you and, and you're trying to pull them off and uh, and then your hands still keep the tentacles on them but you, you, yeah, yeah. my hands are so cold i didn't actually feel them and it was only like later i'd so sort of take my wetsuit off and go to the toilet and all of a sudden things would start stinging that shouldn't sting um and then it'll yeah, rub yeah. my eye you know oh, so that was pretty bad but where i had nasty where i had the, the sort of the beard 
it um it get kind of helps her from that on that day on i sort of grew the anti-jellyfish protection beard so and then from now I, I, since then i've just been too lazy and i think it gives me superpowers so i've kept it <laughs> i want i wonder how it performs on the bike you know your bike is you know you've got the aero bars you know you're super <laughs> streamlined yeah. and then you've got this kind of huge forest on your face you know <laughs> does that hold you back do you think apparently not so specialized did an aero tunnel on a beard before and after and it, it makes no difference because your chest is right there anyway so your chest is taking more of the the aero so apparently not um it it does still becomes a hindrance you know a little like i'd fly into fly in there after a couple of days and so you know a couple of years ago i got the across europe cycling world record it's self-supported record and um yeah the amount of thing it was out of hand then it was just before i had my son and and I kept, I kind of was in this phase of like, bigger is better. Like, I just want a massive beard. I look back at pictures now and I'm like, I told, I told my wife, I'm like, you, you stayed with me? Like, really? Like, what? She's like, I like it. Um, but then as soon as I had my son, when I put him in the carrier, the beard was covering his face. So he would just be like, get away. So I've recently chopped off of it off. So it's a little bit easier for him. But uh, no, apparently, apparently for swimming is the worst because when you swim it gets heavy and like goes into your mouth and yeah and that's yeah, sort of that thing tricky so annoying yeah and um yeah let, let's talk a little bit uh sean if that's okay about fatherhood so uh, like you i have a 10 month old as well and it's it's yeah. been a fairly large life change but for someone in in your line of work who relies upon being away for long periods of time doing quite risky endeavors uh how have you found that transition to to fatherhood so it's really interesting, right? So I've had, you know, I've always kind of thought that every 10 years in my life, I'll just like clean slate, try something new. Um, and and that's kind of worked so far. Not to 10, I was a kid. 10 to 20, I was at school. 20 to 30, I was a school portrait photographer. And now 30 to 40, I'm in this world of endurance sport. Um, and I'm 39 now. And I always sort of figured like, by the time I'm 40, I'll have, kind of scratched all those itches those travel itches and i'd have seen the world and it's all going to have been amazing and i was fully prepared to just start a new chapter and i didn't really know what that was going to be i love writing i've written six books and people really enjoy them so i'm going to carry on doing that so i was fully prepared to sort of have a kid maybe do one more big adventure um settle down become an author i love fixing old cars i thought maybe i could get into classic car you know, restorations and things like that. And uh, I love woodwork and metalwork. I make knives and, you know, that sort of thing. I actually, I found this ax when I was 10 years old and I've kept it ever since, but I've put that handle on it recently because it had no handle. So I enjoy that sort of thing, right? So I was fully prepared to do that. So I was like, cool, have a kid, you know, do something. Being an author, I can stay at home. You know, I've got loads of books like in the back of my head. I want to write some fiction and nonfiction and that. Um, and as soon as I had him, the complete opposite happened. All of a sudden, I just had this overwhelming urge to go off and make him proud. Like, it was phenomenal. I just became this, like, this hunter. I was just like, right, I need to do something bigger, better. I want him to brag about me forever and ever. And all of a sudden, it just became, like, had this opposite. And my wife's amazing. Like, she's super supportive as well. So she gets it. So actually, strangely enough, and unfortunately now, and of course, it's the right decision with COVID. I've had to postpone this next big challenge that I have, which is top secret, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, it was going to start in, in June. It was going to take eight months, so longer than anything I've ever done. I was going to be away for eight months in, in parts of the world uh, that were t- pretty much too dangerous for them to even come and join me. Um, so it's weird. It's had the opposite effect. I just now want to go off and just do even crazier harder things you know because you know he's not he's he's 10 months old and it's going to be tough for eight months while i'm away but it's i hope it's not going to have any long-term effects if anything the put the what i get out of it and the, hopefully the inspiration i get to give him you know and these that's become my new carrot so i always sort of have these these carrots i dangle in front of myself and they can be you know, each to their own. But in the past, it's been trying to break the record is a big carrot. Trying to raise money for charity is a big carrot. You know, trying to impress my friends. <laughs> you know, of course, it's a, it's a thing that motivates you, right? And you've already had some adventures together out in the sling. Oh yeah, yeah. Out in the pram. 
yeah, take him for runs in the pram. He's just getting to the age where we can now run in the pram. It doesn't jolt him around too much. Just bought a, a seat for the back of the bike, so that's going to happen soon. Um, just waiting to get a helmet for him because he's, yeah, can't. It's quite difficult to find a child's helmet now with the whole world on lockdown. It, yes, it so, is. Um, uh, yeah. And then, so the ninja training has has begun for Montgomery. Yeah, oh yeah, got him on the treadmill the other day. <laughs> I was hold, he's ten months old. I was holding his hand, and he was sort of walking on the treadmill. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so, his first PB on the treadmill. Yeah, he's faster than me already. It's pretty embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant and you've got a uh you've got a little black book as well sean not of ladies numbers uh, <laughs> but of things that you want to do in your life in the future tell us about that so i think it's important to have stuff to look forward to and i think it's also important to not want to do all these things right now and it's quite easy i think millennials get blamed a lot for this mindset where everything has to be done now but i think it's it's human nature i think be- when you have access to things you you and you can achieve something quicker you 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 want to do it um, it's not the right way and it's it's you, you know it's, there's a lot of psychology behind that which is far more intellectual than i'll ever know but i do know from experience often the things that you work longer for you wait longer for have more chance of staying with you and you appreciate them more and you play the long game you know i i that's my thing i just i like to play the long game so i have this little black book of ideas basically and it's it's ideas that are hopefully going to take me all the way up until my retirement. And they're silly little things like, you know, I want to learn a musical instrument, which I actually have just started. It's, it's, I've got the box here, but I've, I've bought a harmonica. So during lockdown, this is the box for it. It's somewhere. My, again, my son was playing it yesterday. I gave it to him, but he was actually playing it better than I can, which is annoying. Um, uh, so, yeah, you know that I want to live on an island for a bit, you know, and my wife does as well. Like my wife would love to just go and live maybe just for a year on, a, on an isolated island. I'd love to. I love woodworks. So I'd love to build an old school wooden rowing boat and then row an ocean in it. You know, um, I'd like to do a, an Ironman in the Arctic in the winter, you know, and I nearly did that actually uh, a couple of years ago. But I wanted to in my head, I had this beautiful sort of film this sort of art film about this amazing arctic triathlon um and then i spoke to a camera guy and he says do you know that when you want to do this in the arctic it's always dark <laughs> so the film would look rubbish because <laughs> in my head i had all this like crystal blue water with the yeah. snow and everything but then actually that's that's not snowy enough for me so, <laughs> um so yeah so i've got all these ideas and i've got stuff i want to do with my family and i'd love to do a big bike ride with my family one day as well so yeah it's, it's important to have stuff to kind of to look forward to in the future and not wanting to do everything now so that's in uh yeah that's in my my little, my little black book hey you've got it oh, we've all got a dream yeah exactly yeah of course it's important you know absolutely well sean it's been a real pleasure talking to you um before you go, is there anything you'd like to say to any of our medics that are out there on the front line in this pandemic? Anything you'd like to, to say to them? I just want to say thank you so much for all your help. You guys are absolutely amazing. You know, I, I, I just can't imagine what it's like going in and risking your your own livelihoods every single day to, to help other people. So I just want to say thank you from the rest of the world, you know, you know that we, we, we really are thinking of you and we really are... I do appreciate you know all all you've you've put on and i hope everyone on the front line gets knighted <laughs> in new year's on it because you definitely all <laughs> deserve it you know oh, thank you and uh, if people want to find you online what's the best way for them to do that oh gosh um i guess my website seanconway.com that will kind of link you to various places and you can see all my successes and failures as well many of them are up there because it's important to to put those out so people don't think I'm superhuman or an outlier and you know, I'm just a normal Joe blog. So um, yeah, check it out. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time, Sean. Anytime. Thanks for having me, mate. Cheers. Cheers.